Welcome to another Dr. Sadler's Honest Book Review. The book that I have here right now is called Socrates and Other Saints, Early Christian Understandings of Reason and Philosophy. It is by Dariush Karlovich, and it is translated by Arthur Rosman. Uh, it's a very short book, but rather dense. And you might say, why are you reviewing this book? Well, it was sent to me specifically by somebody who wanted to get a review. And I think that's very nice. This is the second time that Dominic Escorpeso has sent me a book to check out. And I'm actually very pleased with this one for reasons I'll tell you about in a bit. And you might say, given the normal themes, you know, applied philosophy, ethics, professional ethics, leadership, self-help, personal development, maybe this is outside of the sphere. But as we're going to see, actually it fits solidly into that, in part because one of the key things that um, uh, Karlovich is uh, highlighting is... Pierre Adot's conception of philosophy as a way of life. Now, this is also something for me to read and review as a scholar because I do work on the notion of Christian philosophy and specifically on the 1930s French debates about Christian philosophy, where the issues involved were probably most thoroughly hashed out by comparison to any debates Prior to that, or any debates that, that followed, it involved about 50 different Francophone authors spilled over into German language, English language, Italian, Spanish, even Latin discussions. That's a whole other uh, can of worms to dig into. So let's jump in and talk about this book. I always like to start off by highlighting three big S's, the style of the work, the structure of the work, and then kind of a summary of the work. So the style, we can start off by saying, listen, this is an academic work. So, you know, you're going to find a fairly extensive bibliography for a book that's actually, uh, you know, a little bit more than 90 pages, including its index. Um, there are a lot, as you can see, of footnotes, sometimes taking up half of the page. You know, sort of typical of an academic monograph, which essentially this is. But it is readable by a not primarily academic audience who is interested in the questions that are being raised and to some degree resolved within this book. Um, there's also something else that's rather tip. Well, there's two features that are rather typical of academic works. So there's a primary source abbreviations. Uh, what would you call it? You know, like a coding in here that refers to all these interesting works that we're going to talk about. And there's a forward by another important academic, Remy Brog, who wrote a, um, a pretty lengthy, about five page forward to the work that tells you what he made of it. So, you know, it, it is an academic work. Um, you can definitely get something out of it if you are not an academic, and I think it's it's worth reading. The translation is by Arthur Sebastian Rosman, who I don't know, but um, I would guess has done a pretty good job here. There's only a tiny number of things where you're like, ah, I'm not sh quite sure if that uh, was the best translation, not because I can read Polish, but because you're like, oh, that sounds a little weird there. But it's it's very readable, very well edited, I would say, as well. So that's quite important. Um, it is a short monograph. So this is a work that is roughly 86 pages of full text. And then, of course, there's an introduction as well. So we're, we're, we're talking really about 90 pages worth of writing. So a short study of something. And this leads us into the structure. So it's set up with um, four main chapters and a conclusion. The fourth chapter is significantly longer than the others. And so it begins with a short introduction 
the chap the first chapter is called Who's Athens, which Jerusalem, obviously sort of a reference to Alistair McIntyre, who's not discussed in the text at all, but you could see this as potentially being in the shadow of McIntyre in good ways. And then uh, we have uh, a chapter called What Do Athens and Jerusalem Have in Common? Chapter 3, How Much Wisdom Is There in Philosophy? Chapter 4, Selection and Adaptation. And it's going to be oriented, as we're going to talk about in just a bit, around three main questions that are being dis discussed in the work. And uh, there's also, in the fourth chapter, some... I won't call them extensive, but really solid studies of three early Christian philosophers, Justin Martyr, uh, Clement of Alexandria, and Tertullian. Three different people writing in three different places at different times, and with complementary, as interestingly is going to be argued, perspectives on the relationship between philosophy and Christianity. So it is a book about uh, early Christian philosophy, as you can guess. That is the subject matter. And the if we want to give a summary of it, and it's a challenge to try to summarize a book like this, even though it is quite short, in a very short phrase. But I would say, if we wanted to put it this way, it might be a little bit enigmatic. Christianity and philosophy are both more complicated than they're typically made out to be, and their interrelation and intersection in something that we can call Christian philosophy is also more complicated than people have made it out to be, and we run into troubles when we demand or desire for it to be made more simple than it actually is. So let that suffice as a summary of the work. Okay, so key ideas. There's a lot packed in here into this short little work. Um, the focus is on what we call the church fathers and their attitudes towards evaluations and even incorporations of and uses of philosophy prior to Christianity becoming established as a dominant cultural force within the late Roman Empire. So one way of summarizing this is to use Constantine as a dividing point, right? Constantine, the emperor who famously uh, converted to Christianity and made Christianity not the official religion, but a legitimate religion and certainly favored it within his circles and actually, you know, took a stand within uh, doctrinal disputes. And so we're talking about a time before, say, Augustine or Boethius in the West and, and many other writers in the East. So that's where the focus is going to be. Um, there's a hermeneutic here, which is that of, I would say, recovering and understanding the context prior to um, Christianity becoming this dominant intellectual force and, you know, way of sort of running the show, you could say. And he says some really interesting things. So this is in the introduction. The questions that he's asking here not only grew out of my curiosity about how to answer them, but my curiosity about how to ask them. And I think that's a very important distinction there. My curiosity was increased by the fact that the fathers lived in times when Christianity, much like today, was not the spiritual center of culture is not one of the main reasons why we are so curious about the experience of Christians from pre-Constantinian times, right? So there's a, in his view, timeliness in a post-Christian Europe, including post-Christian Poland, uh, to asking the questions that are being raised in here. He also talks about uh, mistakes of viewing Christianity and philosophy as simple there's there's a great discussion in here about whether there really is a here it's it, there's actually a, a section called the problem of a pure christianity right and he says that um there's a, a debate about um uh, whether 
ties with philosophy poisoned the wells of the Christian tradition? Can we say the diseases of Hellenism were deadly to the life-giving truths of Christ's teaching? And he says, well, these, these are not questions that can be indifferent to Christians. Uh, and that, you know, since the Reformation, there's been a lot of engagement on this. Uh, you know, so one, one of the questions he asks, for example, um, was revelation betrayed by philosophers who only passed for Christians? And, you know, he brings up um, Harnock and his what is Christianity? And he ends up saying, listen, we're actually, at least in a scholarly way, beyond these oversimplifying bifurcations. Um, there is some engagement of some of the thinkers in the Christian philosophy debates. So I'm not going to assume that you know much about that. I'll, I'll again say that they took place basically from about 1931 to 1935. There's things preceding it. There's things coming after it. And Etienne Gilson, which is somebody who uh, Karlovich does talk about, is one of the main people involved, as is Jacques Maritain, close associate with Gilson at the time, another really important philosopher who um, represented another position on Christian philosophy, Maurice Blondel, was uh, part of it. There were other um, figures on the rationalist side, Emile Brehier, uh, Leon Brunschvig, there were neo-scholastics like Fernand von Steinbergen, Abbe Penido, uh, Mondonet, Pierre Mondonet, all, all sorts of other people involved. So there was a wide array of positions. There were even some Protestants who got involved, Jacques Bois, for example, um, uh, Suryu as well from an Augustinian perspective. And we could go on and on and on about this. One of the great uh, irrationalist philosophers, Leon Shestov, was also involved towards the end of the debate. And Gilson and Shestov are really the only people that uh, Karlovich is going to engage and, and talk about in this. But a lot of what he's saying is germane to the, the debates that, that took place. Um, there were uh, three questions that I mentioned that he is going to see as important. There's actually a section called Three Questions. And he says, um, my decision to embrace this risky undertaking is based on my belief in the merits of taking up three distinct yet interconnected questions. Now, he's not going to tell you what those are until a little bit further on, and then he will outline them. So he says... Um, if we agree the pagans came to know some part of the truth, then, one, we must ask how it happened. Two, what portion of the truth did they come to know? Three, whether philosophical knowledge of this truth is uh, needed after the fullness of truth was revealed by God. And he says, above all, the first question is a question about the causes of the possible overlaps between the teachings of the pagan and revelation. The second problem constitutes an evaluation of the factual range of similarities, a question about how much truth can be found in philosophy. The third pro problem pertains to the issue of selection and adoption. That is a question about the usefulness of philosophy and ways of using pagan philosophy in Christian teaching and life. And then he says, these are the three domains which, as it seems to me, will help best characterize the stance of Christians towards philosophy, and at the same time, they'll help us to avoid accusing the theologians of ignorance, chicanery, lack of consequence, exuberance and rhetorical enthusiasm, or even psychological disorders. And interestingly, who does he bring up there? Carl Jung and his study, Psychological Types. Um, going on a little bit further, um, he notes that one thing that we need to be careful about is um, confusing rationality and philosophy or conflating the two of those. Um, I think that's quite true, and um, it's, he's got a good treatment of what he calls Tertullian's rationalism. Now, if you only know a little bit about Tertullian, You've probably heard credo quia absurdum, I believe because it's absurd. And then what does Athens have to do with Jerusalem? Well, Tertullian wrote a lot and he's not just throwing reason out, throwing the proverbial baby out with the bathwater. Um, 
And so he says, being anti-philosophical is not the same thing as being anti-rational. There's a Christian use of reason that's possible. Um, and uh, we find him talking as well, this is a little bit later, about um, some Christians. And he, he picks out uh, Harnack there uh, again. Uh, he says, according to Harnack, Justin's equating of the Logos with Jesus Christ constituted the starting point of Christianity's Hellen Hellenization. Yet, for early Christians, there was a widespread belief, even in Tertullian, that the harmony between laws of nature discovered by reason and God's revealed laws does not cancel out the supernatural or lead to the naturalization of the Christian truth. So what he's, in effect, doing here is sketching out for us the models that were being very thoughtfully developed by at least some people within the early Christian community and taken as helpful, even normative, by other members of that early Christian community as well and saying, hey, if scholars like Harnack want to call this Hellenization so much the worse for them, they're actually doing kind of, you know, sketchy uh, scholarship of that. Um, there's some good discussion about uh, Platonism and um, the role that it's playing. We can say that, um, here we go, this is uh, in, in uh, discussion about um, uh, Tertullian and, and others as well. He says, um, in our search for the reconstruction of works mentioned by Tertullian, we can find help in Christian apologies that frequently featured separate chapters devoted to this problem. They follow general principles. The greatest attention was paid to those writings which stress final causes which prove the existence of the one immaterial and transcendent God. The least attention was given to the mechanists, atheists, materialists, fatalists, and those who deprecated the rule of God's providence over the world. So who would be the, let's call them fellow travelers, perhaps for these early Christians. So he says, these are the reasons why Plato was so popular, especially the Timaeus, the Demiurge, the Gorgias, the judgment of the soul, or the seventh letter, the inexpressibility of the knowledge of God. It was also the reason why the Stoics garnered so much respect, especially because their strict ideals of living properly on the other hand, there was a universal rejection of the atomists and Epicureans because they did not subscribe to these principles. So what we see in, among the early Christians is not just a blanket you know, adoption of, well, Platonists and Stoics, good, uh, atomists and, and Epicureans, bad, Aristotelians, uh, who knows exactly where they, they fit in. Uh, it's more you know, selective. It's more, well, we like this about them. We don't like this about them. It's more eclectic, you could say. Um, a little bit later, he's going to raise the question of whether philosophy, now this is touching on Pierre Adot's discussions of philosophy as a way of life. Could the early Christians really look at philosophy as a way of life, or was that something that um, it was deficient in, right? So he's going to consider uh, several different thinkers, including Tatian, who we'll mention a little bit later. Um, so, you know, the Christians have kind of a nuanced view on this. Uh, a little bit later in the, the work about, ha well, more than halfway through in, in the beginning of chapter four, um, which is dealing with the third question, we see that, uh, I'm gonna just read this, this passage. The task of all philosophy, including Christian philosophy, is the therapy of souls who have been led astray by the demands of the passions and false pictures of happiness. By differing in their opinions about starting points and their visions of philosophy's goals, the philosophical schools also differed in their choices of therapy, their sets of exercises for enabling the soul to realize its natural perfection, the doubts of the Christians when it came to this selection process in no way differs from those of the Platonists, Peripatetics, Epicureans, or Stoics, as they pertain to evaluating the usefulness of particular fields of philosophy, or more widely, the value of the cultural heritage of 
antiquity. The goal, the telos, and the perfection, teleosis, constitute the, vis the vistas of Greek philosophy and are the most substantial criteria of selection. When the Christians rejected pagan philosophy as an alternative way of life, it could no longer be an object of interest in itself. The consequence of ignoring what I've outlined is not only the abandoning of the doctrinal frames of Christianity, but also the actual embrace of another way of life. That is a goal entirely different than the one proposed by Christianity. It seems to me that this is how we could understand the utterance in the famous dream of the great enthusiast of Cicero, St. Jerome, who heard the following bitter words pronounced from the throne of God, uh, Cicero, not a Christian, right? So um, philosophy is a way of life. Uh, adopting that lens, which I know is correct about, helps us to see that there was a great winnowing, a great selection process going on among these early Christian thinkers and that they you know are involving spiritual exercises and therapy um, there's uh, several other ideas that I want to bring up one of them is actually coming up much later in the work uh, in the discussion of Tertullian and he says that um, much like the majority of ancient philosophers now this is a great thing to point out um, Tertullian does not devise a doctrine. Instead, he fosters a spiritual transformation without losing time preaching to the choir. So this has to do with why does he talk differently in different works? Like Platonic Socrates, who addresses Callicles differently than he does Euthyphro and Parmenides altogether differently, Tertullian adjusts his own discourse to the personal needs of his hearer. He does not speak to the alcoholic about the benefits of alcohol, nor does he tell a coward about caution. St. Jerome agrees with this universal precept about the nature of a moral education. There's no greater folly than to teach a pupil what he knows already. So, you know, different authors, even, even sometimes the same author, are writing with different audiences in mind. Rather than trying to provide a one single system of Christian philosophy or Christian doctrine, they're writing a number of different things. And, you know, as uh, uh, Karlovich is pointing out, this is what most ancient philosophers actually did, including Plato. Even Aristotle, we can say. Aristotle recognizes in the rhetoric the importance of understanding who your audience is. Cicero does that. Plutarch does that. Uh, Seneca does that in his letters. Epictetus does that. This is an integral part of ancient philosophy that often gets left aside when we let people who want to schematize it and get away from the actual text start um, reducing it in certain ways. The other thing I think is important to bring up uh, comes up several different times. Um, earlier on in the text, and it is that the um, uh, Christians are using previous attitudes towards philosophy and within philosophy to combat pagan philosophy. So he says, um, we should not forget that the Christian theologians utilized many arguments lifted out of the Greeks, but against the Greeks. The critique of the anthropomorphism and immorality of polytheistic religion was, at least since the time of Xenophanes, a basic weapon in the Greek philosophical armory. The Christians borrowed weapons from this armory at will. Right? It's enough to mention how three important fragments of Xenophanes survived only because they were so popular among Christians. The theory of Euhemerus of Messene, arguing gods were merely divinized humans, was also extremely popular. So there are ideas that are coming up and being used polemically uh, within Greek philosophy that are then being adopted by the Christians. And there's a very interesting, and I think completely correct, discussion here about what Tertullian is doing. When Tertullian is saying, what does Athens and Jerusalem have in common? He's actually echoing, as uh, Karlovich is pointing out, a Roman distrust of Greek philosophy and culture. So he says... Um, 
The division of, between Jerusalem and Athens is undergird by the division between the empire and Athens, and so Tertullian inherits all the prejudices of brave soldiers, lawyers, and statesmen whose heads were all turned by philosophy. The ambivalent relationship of the Romans to philosophy, which combined an extreme revulsion and contempt, philosophy as a Hellenistic disease, with wonderment and adoration, can best serve as a reference point for understanding not only Tertullian's stance, but also the stances of many other Christians. So isn't that an interesting thing to point out? So these are some of the main ideas circulating around in this short little work. I think you can tell that I'm a fan of this text. There's a lot of good stuff about it. I mean, part of it is that it's painstakingly researched, uh, very well written, very well thought through. Uh, I think that most of the contentions that are being made, certainly all of the big scale contentions are on point and actually make a significant contribution to understanding this early period of Christian philosophy and Christian culture more generally. I also really like the attention to the diversity within uh, pagan philosophy and Christian uh, responses, critiques, incorporations of it. Not all Christians see things the same way. There's no such thing out there as like the abstract essence of Christianity, which then we can compare against the abstract essence of philosophy. This is where so many interpretations of, you know, what, what the possible relationship could be and uh, visions of Christian philosophy went wrong in the Christian philosophy debates. As uh, Gelson pointed out, as Maritain pointed out, as Blondel pointed out, as Marcel pointed out. So that's actually, I think, a very strong point. This grasp of plurality, not quite pluralism, but certainly that there is a diversity. And it doesn't mean that anything goes, because you still want to say, well, there are things that veer off into heresy, into Gnosticism, into a type of rationalism. So, you know, or he brings up Pelagianism at the very end and talking about, you know, Augustine, right? So uh, I think that's a, a real strength of the work. Um, it, you know, Bragg uh, in, in uh, giving a little synopsis of it at the beginning leads you to think that the book is basically just going to be talking about Justin Martyr, Clement of Alexandria, and Tertullian, it's, it's talking about St. Paul, Augustine, Jerome, we've already mentioned some of these, Tatian, who's got a much more pessimistic address to the Greeks, um, and, and quite a few other authors, uh, Hermaeus, uh, Irenaeus. It's not going into as great depth and detail as it is with the big three that it's looking at, but it is, it, it's, it's telling you a story. It's preserving a sort of continuity between these thinkers that I think is quite important. And it's bringing up uh, other thinkers as well, like Philo of Alexandria, who uh, gets discussed at several points. Um, the, the fourth part, these are really deep studies, even though they're quite short, of Justin Clement, Clement and Tertullian. Uh, I think they're, they're really quite good. And um, I certainly learned some things in the process. It's given me a lot to think about. Um, I, I like the emphasis on um, spiritual exercises and being able to use ado. I think perhaps, you know, sometimes people can go a little bit too far in thinking that ado, like, is the only person who ever came up with this. Ado himself, if you read him, he'll be like, no, no, there's, this has been lots and lots and lots of people have been talking about this, including during my century. But this is a good passage to read here. When we free ourselves from thinking about ancient philosophy in purely doctrinal categories, um, we can discover a series of techniques of spiritual conversion in which Tertullian, like Clement, permanently introduced into Christianity. 
In Tertullian, we can find all the Stoic Platonic exercises mentioned by Philo of Alexandria. For example, study, meditation, cures for the passions, recalling the beautiful, self-control, doing one's duties or others, such listening with a constant attention that is focused on oneself and indifference towards indifferent things. Um, so this is, you know, this is a, a real strong point, I think, of the work. And uh, the last thing that I'll say is, as a scholar of people's ideas about Christian philosophy, and specifically the Christian philosophy debates, I think this book is making some small and measured, but still important contribution to understanding these, these important early thinkers that, that shouldn't be underplayed and probably should be read more. So those are all really good points about the work. The features that I would say are problematic are not damningly so, but more on the level of, ah, I wish there had been this, or I wonder what's going on there. So my, my criticisms here should be taken perhaps with a little grain of salt. Um, you know, it is a very short book, so it's not going to go into as much depth as, you know, some of the other literature that's out there about the relationship between Christianity and philosophy. I've mentioned the Christian philosophy debates. Uh, I've also mentioned that Karlovich only talks about Gilson and Shestoff and doesn't look at any of the other authors concerned with the debates, which is that a, a deficit to the book? Maybe, maybe not. It depends on what context we're reading it in, but I, I think it would have been interesting given the theme of like focusing on life and practice had he actually looked at Blondel, um, Marcel, and Emile Brayer, who in fact dismissed Christian philosophy as just being about life and practice and stuff like that in his earliest contribution to the debate. Um, there are a few infelicities here and there where you're like, eh, that's, that doesn't strike me as quite right. Uh, where is this coming from? So one of these is very early on in the work where he talks about um, the controversy between the skeptics and the academics. That is a controversy at the heart of philosophy itself. Well, the academics were skeptics. So does he mean between Pyronian skeptics and then less extreme skeptics? Well, he can't mean that because within the academy there were debates about, you know, um, extreme and, and mitigated skepticism, as we know from Cicero. So that, I'm not quite sure what that means. Um, he also talks about uh, the blindness of a Shestoff. One needs the blindness of a Shestoff not to notice that philosophy, Greece, attachment to error, Athens, and the academy need not be synonyms for natural reason, but historical examples of a compromise. I gather that the main work of Shestoff that um, Karlovich has actually read is only Athens and Jerusalem and not any of his earlier works where let's just say he's, he's more skeptical, less intransigent about those sorts of things. So I, I'm not quite sure what that's about. There's two things that concern Anselm of Canterbury. One where he goes, I think, too far and doesn't bother to provide a, a citation. He tells us that um, this rationalism finds its ultimate expression in the writings of Anselm of Canterbury, who considers it possible to prove nearly all Christian dogmas through natural reason. Well, that isn't quite what Anselm says when you look at his works like, you know, the Cur Deus Homo, which is probably one of the works where he's doing that. He, it's all kind of provisional, and he doesn't say just natural reason by itself. God is helping out. So I think this is kind of a bad reading of Anselm. Uh, and he doesn't provide any citation for his, his assertion about this. He has another thing that he says that um, is about Anselm, but he attributes it to Augustine instead, which I think is a bit of a mistake. He talks about um, this latter tradition confirming the distaste of the apologists for fideism, both the Augustinian 
faith-seeking understanding and the philosophy of Aquinas grow out of the perspective of the fathers with regard to this matter. Well, Augustine didn't talk about faith-seeking understanding, fidens quaerens intellectum. That's right out of Anselm's Proslogia, right? He actually wanted to title the work that. So a little bit of a mix up there, but you know, uh, people make mistakes. Um, there's another one as well um, where Eula Bea, which is, um, you know, typically translated as caution, gets translated as fear. Now he's, tra he's, he's talking about Clement. So he says, wherefore the divine law writes, Clement appears to me necessary to menace with fear, Eula Bea, that by caution and attention, pro soque, the philosopher may acquire and retain absence of anxiety on eremia, going, going on. And then he says this passage implies, says Pirado, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't know if it's the translator of Clement got it wrong in Polish and then it got wrong in English or if Ado got it wrong and um, Karlovich is picking up on it. But it, it's, Eulabea is caution. So that's a little bit of confusion there as well. Um, the only other thing that I think is kind of an issue, and you know, it's very easy to fault an author for not writing the book that you would have written or would have liked to have written. There is one really important early Christian philosopher who fits into this era and... I think who would have contributed something to this that is only mentioned once and basically just in passing and is not explored at all. And that's Lactantius. So, you know, he's got his Institutes of the Christian Religion, uh, On the Anger of God, and a few other works as well. And I, I'm not sure why he is just essentially ignored in this, because I think it would have strengthened the work to do this, but maybe maybe Karlovich wanted to just have uh, three, you know, as a nice, even, uh, actually odd number, but even uh, number for, for this to work with and didn't want to address Lactantius. So that's all the quibbles that I have. And these criticisms really are at the level of, of quibbles more than, you know, genuine, ooh, you've got something really bad here going on. All right, so my final thoughts about this work, uh, Socrates and Other Saints, Early Christian Understandings of Reason and Philosophy. Good work. I'm really glad to have come across it. I thank Dominic for having sent it to me. Um, definitely a book that I will be keeping and going back to again. And I would recommend that if you're interested in these questions and topics and issues, whether you're a Christian or somebody who's just interested in the, the history of ideas and ancient philosophy and its engagement with an important, you know, religion, I think this is a book that you can definitely benefit from. You know, um, Karlovich is probably, um, I'm guessing, somebody who's quite interested in Christianity, perhaps practicing Christianity, but you don't have to be in order to get quite a lot of benefit out of this this work.